Hey everybody, it's Guy with That Kilter Guy videos at thatkilterguy.com and today what we're going to show you is how to repair a large crack on the ceiling like the one right above me or the one in this picture you'll see on your screen and this crack is really common in houses and so I'm going to show you how to fix this right. There's some steps I see other people do that aren't really necessary and some that they don't do so I'm going to show you the right way. I have fixed literally thousands of these. We're gonna do that right after this. Hey, thanks for stopping by. As always, I appreciate you guys. You guys are what keep me doing this. I love teaching you guys, showing you how to do this and show you how to do it right. That's become my slogan. So we're gonna show you how to do this right. What we have is a common crack in the ceiling that's often caused by stress, uh, movement of the house, it could be expansion, contraction, different things can cause them. But we're gonna show you how to fix that the right way. Now, before I get too far, I wanna mention, be sure and check out our website. We've got a link here. We're giving away a free guide on how to choose the right contractor for your job and one on common mistakes that can ruin your drywall job. And there's a lot of good pointers in there that'll help you do it right. Also, be sure and subscribe if you want to stay up with all of our videos. We're going to be putting out tons of good videos and we try and take our videos just a little bit further beyond just showing you how to do it. We're going to show you how and explain the whys in the house and go a little bit more in depth so you understand why you're doing it that way and how that applies to the next repair you do. So first thing we've got to do is what I like to do is find a ceiling joist or if it's a wall, you find your, your studs and put as many screws in as you can basically. So let me pan up to the ceiling and point out some things. Okay, now I know I'm off camera. What I wanna point out is you see the crack here, but what we did is we found the ceiling joist and then we put a new screw on each side. Now, what we look for is if you put that screw in and it raises that ceiling much at all, go ahead and put a second one out here. So you'd have two on each side. If it didn't seem to move very much, you can usually leave it with just one screw on each side or just put two and be safe. The next step we do is go ahead and scrape it. And you're looking for any bumps in that because you don't want those bumps that often exist in texture to end up underneath your mesh tape. Then what I like to do is spray little spots of spray adhesive. You see the red spot here and the one on the end. And what's, what that's for is we're going to run our mesh tape across here. And I actually had this up and peeled it down so some things stuck to it. So we run it across there and stick it like that. Now the reason I do the adhesive, you don't have to because this stuff is self-adhesive, but a lot of times it just doesn't want to stick real well or it'll stick and you think it's great to go do some things, mix up some mud, come back and half of it's falling down. So I just put a little spot of adhesive on the ends and a few in the middle and it never falls down. Also, it'll keep it from wrinkling so much, so you can do it either way. Okay, once we have the mesh tape up there, the next step is we want to check it and see how much of a hump it is. Because anytime we're repairing a crack, we're almost always, I'd say 90% of the time, going to end up with a hump because we had a fairly flat surface and it might have even been a joint, which probably had a slight hump to start with. Now we're putting mesh tape on it and we're going to put more mud. We're going to make an even bigger hump. So we want to try and get an idea how bad it is to start with, and that'll tell me how wide I've got to coat it, because the bigger the hump is, the more it sticks down from the ceiling, the wider you've got to coat it, because I've explained this on another video about why wider knives are better, but here's an illustration that shows how we need to float it. We need to float it out much wider than the repair itself, not like in this illustration here where it's coated too narrow. And the reason for coating it white is the whiter it is, 
the more gradual the shadow will be because shadows are what give away the humps on ceilings and walls. So you make that nice gradual hump. The shadow is so subtle, it breaks up enough that our eyes can't detect it, but the hump is still there. So let's check that right now. Okay, so the way I check it is I use my 12 inch straight knife and we know that this edge is nice and straight. So just put it up there and voila, we have one that's not going to have a big hump, at least not right here. Here it has a little bit. You can probably see it rocking and light coming through. Whereas right here, see how there's no light coming through and it's not rocking? That one's almost recessed. But if we keep going down the line and checking it, after we check it some more, we can see that it's got a slight hump, but this one's actually not too bad. So we're going to coat it. The first time I'm just gonna coat it right down the middle. And then I'm gonna, this is gonna be with a fast setting hot mud. And that, that way, I think I'm gonna use 45 minute because if you look around, I'm doing a job here where I've got all kinds of repairs. It's a kitchen remodel. So I've got quite a few little repairs. And by the time I coat all those, it's gonna take me about 40, 35 to 40 minutes. So 45 minute will fall right in there. It gives me 45 minutes of working time. So we'll do that down the middle on that one. And then what we will do is split it with regular all purpose joint compound like this one in the picture here. I use plus three most of the time. And we'll split that out about 20 to 24 inches wide. That will give us that gradual hump. And then by tomorrow when we sand it, it should be subtle enough. And if I check it and I feel like it's still got too much of a hump, I'll split it even further. And in that case, I would split it to about 32 inches. So I'd run one down the middle and then I'd go out here and overlap it a little bit so that it gets even wider. But I don't think we're gonna have to do that on here. You have to make that call on yours depending on how bad it is. Okay, I've got my hot mud mixed up. I'm ready to start coating things. So I'm gonna get on my stilts. Now I shot a separate video on how I get on and off my stilts and some things about it if you wanna check that out. So yeah, if you want to get into the party, you can move around pretty good. I mean, I'm gonna go ahead and get on my stilts and then show you how we coat it and I'll have to adjust the camera to pan back up to the ceiling here in a minute. I have a very quick change pair of stilts. I've made them this way. They're a little bit dangerous. Watch my video and you'll see why. So I don't recommend you do it this way, but I'm about getting things done quickly. And not many guys can get on and off a pair of stilts that quick. So my modifications kind of do that for you. All right, now let me pan back up. All right, I've got myself a pan of hot mud here. This is the fast setting joint compound. We mix it up from powder. You can kind of see it's slightly thin. It's not super thick, but you don't want it so thin that you're just constantly dripping. This is right on the border. This stuff will often change. Sometimes it'll go thinner, sometimes it'll go thicker after you mix it up, but. Okay, like I say on this coat, all we really want to do at this point is run a coat down the middle. And I try not to go completely off camera here too much. Huh? I think we can do the last little foot there. Then, like coating most any joint like this, the way, I've, I've got other videos that kind of go into more detail about spreading mud, but you want to load your knife up fairly heavy. You can see, you can see in this video, I've got quite a bit of mud on there. Sometimes I will clean off those corners. I drip a little bit less. Then you put your knife up here at an angle of about a 45 degree angle and push. You want to push. You want to push a decent amount and as you go along you just keep leaning it over i'm exaggerating a little too quick so that put it on extra heavy then you can just kind of drag your knife back across and thin it out if you want and that evens it out 
Now, it's gonna be hard to see in this video, but you wanna just cover the joint tape. You don't want it too deep on it, and you don't want the joint tape showing through. In this case, the mesh tape. Okay, then you want to feather the edge, which means putting it up here and keeping more pressure on the outside edge so that you're thinning the outside edge a lot, but not any on the middle. Okay, see we thinned all the edges down now. This one's a little tricky because we have to turn the corner, but you just put medium light pressure on it and go over it at about that angle. And there you have it, that looks pretty good. I see hints of the mesh tape showing through, just here and there for the first coat. That's pretty much perfect. So we're gonna let this set up for about 30 minutes and come back and show you a second coat of regular mud. And I'll show you how much it humped. It'll probably get a little bit worse than it was. So we'll go ahead and coat it out about 24 inches wide. Okay, it's now day three. So the first day we prepped it, put the screws in, put the mesh tape on. Second day we, well actually the first day we actually also got a coat of mud on it. Second day we put a second coat on, wider, as you can see here. And this is what it looks like, dry. And now we're ready to sand it. Now, when you split it this way, you can have them big lap marks down there that you can see in the image and you'll often get bubbles in your mud too. So we do have to sand when it's this wide. If it's narrower, we often don't have to sand as much. And I'm going to sand it with my quarter cable drywall sander. This is a really cool sander. You watch, I'll sand, there'll be very little to no dust. There's a whole video on that if you want to check it out. I'll try and put that at the end if I can, or just look it up by subscribing to our channel, go to our videos, and you'll, you'll find it in the drywall section somewhere. So we're just going to sand it enough to do the same basic concept, which is we want to make that hump that we've created to be gradual and as thin as possible. But if we start seeing our joint tape coming through, that's as far as we want to sand. You can't push it past that. And if any comes through, I'll actually put a really thin touch-up coat on it before I spray the texture. The final step of sanding will be to feather out these edges. If you don't feather these edges to where you make them super, super thin, you actually, I'll show you that, but you actually got to get them so thin that they're almost invisible on the edge. And that's so that when you blend your texture, that edge doesn't come through. So let's go ahead and sand now.
After you flat sanded it, the final step is to sand these edges. I should also mention that flat sanding this, normally just use a drywall uh, hole sander. Don't try and flat sand all of this with a sanding sponge because a pole sander, as you see in this illustration, the pad is actually aluminum, so it's fairly solid, has a little thin rubber on it so that it doesn't just dig in and scratch a lot but it tends to get things a lot flatter. I'm actually going to go this one final time with my pole sander for that reason. My Porter Cable drywall sander, it's got a foam backing on it and it tends to conform kind of like these do. So these work great on the edges, but through here you just need a little more flatness. So all you're trying to do here, I'm just going to show you a little bit because I probably should get a mask, but you're just trying to sand these edges. So I tilt my sponge to where the edge matches out here and that way I'm doing a tapered sanding. You don't want to lay it flat because this edge will actually gouge and you won't get that tapered. So Okay, that's really fine. I'm gonna show you a before and after. I'll show you the edge I didn't sand versus the one I did so you can see how far you wanna take it. And you can see it doesn't take a whole lot to get it to sand to there. Now you can potentially wet sand this, but I would only do that as if you've got a nice tight edge to start with. I have a video on wet versus dry sanding. If you want to check that out, I'll, I'll explain more why I don't really favor wet sanding very often. It just doesn't work as good. It kind of works, but this will give you the best job. So after this, the next step is just to spray the texture and do a match on it. And I'm going to do a whole separate video on matching texture because that's a whole art in itself. But I do have a video coming out about this spraying texture and that kind of explains it. But later I'll do a video on matching. So what I'll do is I'll show a heavy knockdown and then probably a lighter knockdown. And then I'll smooth out part of it and then I'll show you how to match that smooth part back to here because there's some little tricks to it and I don't want to get into all that here. I'm just showing you how to fix this because you may actually have an orange peel. You could have a skip trial. I don't know what you guys have. So go watch the right video on that. And one of those videos will help you match your texture. So that's basically it. But before you go, as always, there's some little links popping up here on the screen for other videos. There's a subscribe button. I think it's up on the top corner and uh, one of our free ebooks will pop up here too. Thanks a lot for stopping by and I'll see you on the next video.